Glad to be here this morning and uh, so thankful for the privilege um, to stand up and open the Word of God. This book um, has done more for my life than, than can ever be described, uh, but uh, God's Word uh, changes me. It has changed me and changes me, and that's what God's intent in that is because there's a lot in us that needs changed. And uh, God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It just reaches right in there, finds its way to where it, where, uh, it needs to address, and uh, we, we do well to let it uh, do what it needs to do. Uh, I'm going to preach from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning, if you'll turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> And this morning, we're going to take a, a somewhat in-depth look at this salvation that uh, God's Word talks about. I'm talking about the kind of salvation that I came to know in, uh, on October 17th, 1984, when I was a five-year-old boy, and uh, the kind of salvation that uh, uh, a young man that shares the same name as me, Joe, I can't forget his name. I mean, that'd be horrible if I... Forgot Joe Kresge's name, but the kind of experience, uh, the kind of salvation he experienced on Friday afternoon, there is only one salvation, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, I love preaching about salvation, and I love uh, talking about it. I love reading about it in God's Word, where He just makes things so clear to us. And so I want to look at that this morning. And we're going to be in Second Corinthians five here, and to give you a little bit of background. Paul has, uh, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians 5, Paul has written another letter to the church at Corinth. Anybody know what it's called? 1 Corinthians, very good, uh, very good. Uh, 1 Corinthians was written, and uh, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, it is a scathing letter. Uh, Paul has to write to a church in Corinth that has, has forsaken so much of the way they should be, the way they should practice. They had lost sight of what they were supposed to believe in many cases. And, and uh, Paul had to write to them and just set a lot of things straight with very bold language. And it's just, it's a rough letter. I mean, he just, uh, he does some work. He goes to work on them. And then when he writes 2 Corinthians, he commends them, which is a lot better than the first letter. Because in the second letter, he said, look, I was afraid after that first letter how you were going to respond but in, in the second letter, he says, I'm so glad that you heard my words as the very words of God. You took to heart the things that I brought to your attention and you aligned yourself with the way that you're supposed to be according to truth. And so 2 Corinthians is, is a lot different letter in its uh, attitude and in its purpose because they had, they had fixed a lot of things and yet one thing kind of was still under attack and that was Paul's apostleship, his authority in the gospel was under attack and so he had to defend that a little bit that he was a servant of God called by God that his, that his word uh, did have authority and that's kind of what he's dealing with here in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians but then he explains to them why he has uh, been so faithful to preach the truth of the gospel wherever God has sent him. And, and this is the reasoning that he gives. In verse number 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. In other words, what holds him together and propels him forward is the knowledge of the love that Jesus Christ has for all mankind. He says that knowing the love of Christ constraineth us, it propels us, it keeps us going forward for the gospel because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I'm going to pause right there and I'm going to say there's one reason why the gospel needs to be proclaimed today. And that is because every man, woman, boy, and girl needs to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is this, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
We are all sinners. Uh, if I can just kind of set some thing, invisible uh, things up on the stage here uh, this morning on the platform, if God's over here, God is high and He is holy. He is altogether righteous. He is perfect. He has no sin whatsoever. And all of mankind is born into this world here over here on the other side and we are born sinners and, and not very long after we're born, we begin to manifest our sin nature in sinful choices. Anybody ever seen that? Uh, we look at an infant and we think, oh, what a little angel. Uh, aren't they sweet? I'll tell you what they are. They're little sinners is what they are. And, and it's not very long into infancy before they're manifesting that sin nature. And uh, a lot of times that first manifestation of a sin nature looks something like mine. You know, uh, I walk into the nursery at church or the toddler uh, class at church uh, from time to time and, and I see the battles already raging. That little sin nature is already manifesting itself. And, and that little kid's got that toy and they're not going to let go of that for anybody or anything. And, and they've taken possession of that and they're not going to share. And you, you start to see that selfishness. But let me tell you something. It, it, it doesn't go away with the toddler years. It just continues to manifest itself as it goes on into later years. As a matter of fact, uh, people who refer to little babies as angels I heard one preacher say that as the legs grow longer, the wings grow shorter. <laughs> Can anybody relate to that? Uh, because our sin, our sin is part of our nature and we're born with that nature and after we're born, we begin to manifest that nature by choices to sin. And this is a fact that goes all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. Sin separates man from God. God is holy God is righteous, man is a sinner, and so because of that, there is a separation, there is a divide between, and the Bible calls that separation death. Death means separation. The reason that we call uh, physical death, death, is because it's at that moment that the body is separated from the soul and the spirit, but, but the biblical meaning of the word death is separation, and, and so body, soul, and spirit uh, sin separates man from God and that, and that divide is great and it is vast and it cannot be spanned by man. Man in his sinful condition can never get back to holiness, can never get to righteousness where God is. Uh, one illustration, when I was a director of children's ministries years ago, uh, one illustration that I would sometimes bring before them is I would have a, a, a sheet of paper, just a, a regular sheet of 24 pound copy paper and I would hold it up. There would be no writing on that whatsoever and I would say that the lack of writing on this blank piece of paper represents the holiness and the righteousness of God. There's no mark on Him. There's no blemish. There's no imperfection whatsoever. He is altogether holy, altogether pure. And then I would hold up another piece of paper as blank and as empty as the first one and I would say, this is how God created mankind in His image, also righteous, also pure. But then I would have just a little ink pen and I would say that here's what man decided to do. Man chose to sin against God and then I would just put a little dot on that page representing Adam's choice to sin and disobey God in the Garden of Eden. And you know what? You might look at those two pieces of paper and from a distance you might even say, well, they're really close or man, it's kind of hard to tell uh, or something like that. But reality is still reality. It doesn't make any difference with that paper that represents man. It doesn't make any difference if, if somebody's taken a pen and put a dot or if somebody's taken a Sharpie and colored in the whole page. One is as different from the original as the other because any mark whatsoever means that it is not the same as God. And God can have no part with sin. God can have no part with any iniquity. And so because man is a sinner, uh, whether his life uh, is, a, is, is how other people see it as a, a good life with an occasional misstep 
or whether they're just a horrible person, it really doesn't make any difference because, because one sin still separates from the holiness and the righteousness and the purity of God. And that's where man is. And that's where man would be except for one thing, the love of Christ. That's what makes all the difference. And Paul said the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one, that's Jesus, died for all, then we're all dead. So he comes to a logical conclusion here. He says, the, he says that God has taught him that Jesus' death on the cross was for all, and that means that all were dead. All are separated from God. That, that's what Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, how far short we are doesn't make any difference because we all aren't getting there on our own. Now that necessitates something called reconciliation. Now, uh, 20 years ago when I started pastoring, when I would talk to the, our, the church that I pastor about reconciliation, I would use an illustration that I almost can't use anymore when I would talk about reconciliation. Because when, when I would illustrate reconciliation 20 years ago, I would talk about something called a checkbook. But there's some, there's some people in here right now that have never seen a checkbook. Never heard of a checkbook. I mean, that's almost a thing of the past anymore. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that makes me feel old now. Because when I was a kid sitting in church, a preacher would get up and, and he would talk about dialing a phone and he would do like this. And I would think, you don't dial a phone like that. You dial a phone like that. And now you talk about phones... And uh, the, a recent study was done asking different generations, if you're going to illustrate to somebody by hand signal that you're on the phone, how would you do it? Well, everybody above like 25 did like this. And everybody below 25 did like this. Because phones have, have changed so much. There's a lot of things that change. So here's what I'm going to have to do this morning. I've got to first tell you what a checkbook is. Because I'm sticking with my illustration. I'm not giving it up yet. It's not that old, all right? A checkbook, you would have these pieces of paper and, and you got money in your bank account, hopefully. You got money in your bank account and you could write somebody an IOU or a permission to take this money out of my bank account. And you would sign it and you'd give them to them. That was a check. And then if you had any wisdom at all, you need to flip to the back of the book and you need to write down who you gave money to and how much money you gave them, and you kept a register of that in the back of your checkbook. And then what you were supposed to do is every month when you got your bank statement in the mail, you take that bank statement that shows all of the people who you gave permission to take money out of your account and how much they took out of your account, and you take that bank statement and you take your check in, checkbook and very rarely... Did they have the same balance? Anybody remember what I'm talking about? They, they didn't have the same balance because some people that you gave a check to would hold on to it for four months. And they hadn't taken that money out. And so if you took the bank statement at that point and you just said, all right, this is how much money I've got in the bank, and you just went out and wrote a bunch more checks, you're going to be in trouble because you, you didn't account for that check that you wrote that somebody hadn't cashed yet, somebody hadn't, hadn't deposited yet. So if you had any wisdom at all, what you had to do was you had to take the balance on that bank statement and the balance in your checkbook and you had to go through the list of, of expenditures and, and credits and debits and you had to bring those two balances together and, and make them agree with one another. And that was called reconciling your checkbook. You take two different balances and you bring them together to agree with one another. Now, reconciliation is as simple as this. There are two different ideas, 
parties, persons, whatever. And reconciling them means you bring them together so that they now agree. Now, here's the thing. Even if a sinner wants to be reconciled to a holy God, the sinner cannot do that. The sinner has no ability to bring himself back into agreement with a holy, righteous God. And here's the fact. Here's the thing. The fact is that sin on the account of the sinner cannot be undone. You can't go back and say, I choose to not have done those things. I choose to not have said those things. I choose to not have thought those things. I choose to have not had that attitude. No, they're done. They are, they are recorded. They are on the ledger. They are part of your balance. You can't do anything about that. There's no eraser for past sins where we can just undo what we've already done. And so if reconciliation was going to take place, it couldn't be by us. That had to come from God. God was going to have to do, listen, God was going to have to do all that was necessary to reconcile man to himself. And remember, I'm not going to let you forget this, the only reason why he would is love. The only reason why God would make reconciliation possible is because of His love. And so what did He do? Well, the wages of sin, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin, what we earn because of our sin, is death. But in Romans 5.8, there's a wonderful verse that says, but God commendeth, or that word means shows, but God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners over here, Christ died for us. A sinless God came to earth and took my place. A God who never had any blemish on Him at all came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life as a man, knelt down in the Garden of Eden one night, and there kneeling in that garden, I believe with all my heart, God laid upon Him the sins of the whole world. I'm talking about all sins of all mankind of all time. Is it any wonder that He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood? Is it any wonder he cried out to the Father, let this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Is it any wonder why an innocent man would stand before his accusers and say not a word, open not his mouth? It was because he himself was innocent, but I believe he was bearing in his own body my sin and your sin and the guilt and the shame of that. And under that weight, he would carry his cross partly to the place where they would crucify him, falling underneath the load to where a man had to be called out of the crowd to help him bear that, that, uh, that, that implement of death the rest of the way. And they would get him up on top of Calvary's hill. They would put nails through his hands and his feet to an old rugged cross and hang him between heaven and earth. And from that cross, he would say this, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But probably the greatest thing that he would say from that cross is, it is finished. Because when he announced from that cross, it is finished, what he was referring to is that the price of all sin that God's righteousness demanded had been paid. God accepted the death of the innocent in the place of the death of all guilty. And thereby, because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross, man could be reconciled once again. And listen to what Paul writes about that. He says, 
verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. I, I, it's, it's impossible in my brain to just skip over verses and not talk about them, so i got to tell you what these verses mean real quick. What, what he's saying here is that he is constrained by the love of God to take the gospel to all of mankind because Christ died for all of mankind and there is no other man that anyone can go to to find reconciliation with God. You know what that means? There's no priest that can forgive sins. There's no pastor that can grant salvation. There's no bishop that can cause you to be right with God. There's no elder that can clear a path for you to God. There is only one who brought reconciliation between man and God, and that is the one who paid the penalty for your sin and my sin and the sins of all mankind. He was on earth in the flesh, but we don't know Him in that way anymore. Now we know Him by faith. Now we know Him as He is revealed in the Scriptures. And all who call upon Him, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 says, are accepted by God in the Beloved. That, that literally means that when I trusted Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sin and save me, that God took me and He placed me in His Son. So that from that moment throughout all of eternity, when God looks at me, He doesn't see Joe Decker the sinner. He sees me with all of the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. He sees me with all of the merits, all of the works, all of the holiness, all of the purity of Jesus Christ, His Son. Because when I called upon Jesus for my salvation, God took me and He placed me in Jesus Christ. So that's all God sees anymore. Man, that's exciting. That's how I know I'm saved. Because when I look at me, I still see a sinner. If you looked at me long enough, you would see a sinner. But when God looks at me, he sees me in His Son, Jesus Christ. So He sees me holy. He sees me righteous because that's who I trusted in. Yes. That's why Paul can write this in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away Behold, all things are become new. That is one of the greatest statements about salvation in God's Word because I was literally made a new creation not because of any good work I did, not because I turned to God, not because of anything other than this. I was a sinner. Somebody told me that I was lost, that I needed salvation, I agreed with God's Word that I was a sinner. I agreed with God's Word that Jesus died for my sin. I believed that in my heart and God accepted me based upon the righteousness of His Son. He made me a new creature in Christ Jesus. I am not who I used to be. I'm made new in Christ. I've got a new outlook on life. I've got a new way of living. I, I, I've, got, I've got peace in my heart that I didn't have. I've got joy that I did not truly experience before. Oh, before I got saved, there were things that made me happy. But can I tell you, happiness is a cheap substitute for real joy. There's a lot of people that just live to find their next happiness. But oh, the problem is it fades away. But the joy that comes from knowing Jesus is something deep down inside that can never be taken away. 
It can never go anywhere because we're a new creature in Christ Jesus, all because we are in Christ. Now, if you're, if you're reading this, you're probably seeing this, that man still hasn't done anything for all of this. God's done it all. God, God's taking care of all of us. None of this... None of this came about. None of this was offered to mankind, John said, because of the will of the flesh. None of this was, none of this was man's idea. This was all God's idea because of His love. It was God's plan. It was God who worked out His plan. It was God who offered it to mankind. This is all still the work of God. He confirms that in verse number 18 when he says these words. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you notice there's only one way man can be reconciled to God and that is by Jesus Christ. And it is God who does that. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Verse number 19, he's going to get even more detailed in this. He says, to wit, or in other words, in this manner, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Let me go back over that verse real quick. To wit that God, God the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now when you first read that, you know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like, based upon the work of God, the whole world's saved. The whole world's reconciled to God. I mean, isn't that what it says? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses. So if that's all we read, and if we just pull that verse out of its context, and we just read that verse, it sounds like something that's often called universal salvation. In other words, God has already done in Christ all of the work for salvation. God has reconciled the world to Himself. God does not impute sins unto anyone in the world. And so therefore, whether they realize it or not, the whole world is saved because God's already done it all. But there's some problems with that. There's something left out of that. Can I submit to you that that's a growing sentiment among Christianity? Do you know there are Christian churches this Sunday morning that got up and sang songs in their worship time that talked about all of the work God did in salvation but leave out something very, very crucial? And here's what's left out. Personal responsibility. You see, I believe with all my heart that God did all of the work of saving mankind and that mankind is completely unable to save himself. I believe that is Bible from start to finish. But man still does have a personal responsibility. Listen to what what Paul writes here. In verse number 19, he says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. Look at verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Do you see what seems like an apparent contradiction here? Paul says in verse 19 that God was in Christ on the cross reconciling the world unto Himself. But in the very next verse, it's like Paul gets down on his knees and begs people, be ye reconciled to God. 
So if God's already reconciled the whole world in Christ, why is Paul begging for people to be reconciled? And the answer is this simple. God's done it all. Will you believe that or not? Will you accept that or not? Will you receive that or not? And this is echoed all throughout the Word of God. John chapter 1, verse number 11, John said, He came unto His own, speaking of Jesus and the Jews, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but to as many as received Him. To them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believed on His Name. Faith is not a work that you do to earn your salvation. Biblical faith is this simple. God's done it all. I believe that. I accept that. And when you believe that, when you personally believe that, then what happens is the reconciliation that God did in Christ becomes you. Because think of, the, think of it this way. God did that work for the whole world and put it in a package. That package was Jesus Christ. So anyone who accepts that package accepts what God did for him. Anyone. Everyone. Whosoever accepts Jesus, believes that what He did was for them, believes that God reconciled them already 2,000 years ago unto Himself when Christ died on that cross for their sins. Anyone who believes that becomes reconciled to God because God already did that work in Christ. But to know it, you've got to be in Christ. And the only way to be in Christ is to accept Him to believe in Him. And the only way to believe in Him is you have to hear that that's an option. And the only way to hear that that's an option is somebody has to tell you about it. And the only way for somebody to tell you about it is somebody has to know it. You see the pattern here that God's will set up? And this is what we live in in the midst of today. This is where God wants us today. God God wants us somewhere in this pattern of knowing, telling, so that others can know and believe, so that they can know and tell, so that others can hear and believe. You see in the pattern? That, that's, what he, that's what he's saying. I, I skipped over some parts. I got to come back to them now. Because Paul said, God did this work in Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the word, the message of reconciliation. God did this work in Christ and has given unto us the ministry, the service of reconciliation. No, no, no. Don't don't think of this the wrong way. You and I aren't reconciling people to God. God's the only one that can do that. And He did that in Jesus Christ. But they've got to hear about it. People have got to hear. The only thing that can bring a person to an understanding of what God's done for them is somebody has to take God's Word and go tell them about it. Somebody has to say, now that I know, that means that God's given me the message of reconciliation. But this message wasn't just for me. This was for the guy across the street from me. This was from the guy next door. This is from the guy I work for the guy I work with. This is for the person I go to school with. This is for the person who hates my guts. Because if you saw it right. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. He didn't say He was reconciling all the good people to Himself. He didn't say He was reconciling all the friendly people to Himself. He said the world. You know what this means? It means that 
In Christ, there is salvation for everyone. The question is never whether or not salvation is for everyone. The question has always been whether or not somebody's in Christ or not. This is, this, is what, this is what Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 10. He said, this is simply stated. He said, Romans chapter 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Remember, God's righteous, we're sinner. Well, what does it take for a man to become as righteous as God? There's only one thing that can do that. That's belief. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And when I believed in Jesus Christ, I became righteous. Not, not in my actions, but in Christ. I became righteous. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That word ashamed means disappointed. No one has ever believed on him and been disappointed. Why? Because the work's already done. We're just tapping into something that's already been accomplished. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't say might. He doesn't say I hope so. He says whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So then he asks this series of questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, you can't, you can't call upon a God that you haven't believed. You can't call upon a Savior that you haven't heard what he did for you. There's nothing to believe if you haven't heard what the foundation of that belief is. So the gospel is a must. How shall they hear, I mean, I'm sorry, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, salvation has something that is so necessary today. All of the work has already been accomplished. But there are personal responsibilities. Personal responsibilities. That's what's missing from a lot of worship today. That's, my, that's what's missing from a lot of churches today. Oh, you'll hear about the love of Jesus. But what you don't hear as much of today is that there needs to be a time in your life when you take personal responsibility for your sin and you place your trust in what Jesus has already finished on your behalf. That's a personal responsibility. It doesn't mean you're saving yourself. God does all the saving. But you've got to accept that. You've got to believe that for yourself. You know, that's why you, can't, you don't get saved and then the rest of your family's saved. You don't get baptized and then everybody around you is good. You, 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 don't, you don't make some kind of spiritual decision and that keeps a hex off of your household or something like that. that. That's not real. Let me tell you what is real. We're sinners. God's holy. A holy God came and became a man, lived a holy, sinless life, died a substitutionary death, rose from the grave, a living Savior, is seated at the right hand of God. And the book of Hebrews says, He ever liveth. That, mean he li that means He lives forever to make intercession for us. Jesus himself said it like this, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. That's reconciliation. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's a personal responsibility. What will you do with Jesus? Will you believe in him? That he died for you so that you could be reconciled to God? Or will you reject him? Once you accept him as your savior, guess what? The responsibility is not done. You now have the message. And you now have the ministry. You say, well, I've never been called. There was a missionary to the Philippines years ago named uh, Bob Hughes. And he said this, why do you need a call when you have a command? If you have the message, you have the ministry. And guess what? There are people in your life that are not in the lives of anybody else in this room. You might be the only gospel missionary they ever hear. But you have the message, so you have the ministry. And people around you need to hear this wonderful message. There is no better news a person can hear than that they're a sinner separated from God, but... God loved them so much that Jesus took their penalty for their sin so that they could once again be reconciled to him in Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, there are still people getting saved. We heard, about, we heard from Brother Joe this morning, and I'm glad I get to call him Brother Joe because he's my brother now. I heard from Brother Joe's testimony this morning. God's still saving people. Joe came home from camp in Christ, God sees him different now than when he went to camp. He sees Joe as perfect. Joe might not see himself as perfect, but God sees him as perfect because he's in Christ. And God wants to see you that way too. I need you to know this. You will stand before God. We all will stand before God one day. And you'll either stand before God as his forgiven child because you accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross as the only way you could be reconciled to a holy God. And I'm telling you, you'll get to spend eternity in God's presence as his child, just like he intended. Or you'll hear these words, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. And nobody will stand before God and say, God, you didn't do what you needed to do to save me because he did. In Christ, he accomplished it all. What will you do with Christ? If you're here this morning and you've never had a time in your life where you've owned your sin and you've agreed with God that you were a sinner separated from Him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you this morning. Would you own that? Would you agree with God that you are a sinner separated from Him? Would you agree with God's Word that Jesus loved you enough not to let you die in your sin and be separated from Him for all of eternity, but He made a way for you to be reconciled back to Him once again. And Jesus came, died for you, rose again, is living today, seated at the right hand of God. And if from your heart you will say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died. I believe you rose again. I believe you are alive right now. And I call upon you to forgive me of my sin and to be my Savior. Here's the promise of God. There's not one person that's ever come to Him that has ever been cast out. If you'll trust Him, He'll save you. There's a song that we sing back home. You probably sing it here. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Listen to this chorus. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. If you need to be saved, why not get that taken care of this morning? If you are saved, why not come in this morning to an altar and saying, God, would you help me to share the word of reconciliation with other people around me? 
God, would you help me to take the ministry of reconciliation seriously? Because Paul said, now then, now look, he's the apostle. But Paul doesn't say, now then, I am an ambassador. (laughs) It's not what he says. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Here's why. For he, that's God the Father, hath made him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that's Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wouldn't you like to know you're in Christ? Wouldn't you like to know that's how God sees you? This morning is an opportunity for you to get that settled. And if you have it settled, this morning is a challenge to take that message outside of these doors, outside of these walls, into these communities and tell people how they can be reconciled to a holy, righteous God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts this morning. Beyond my ability to reach the ears of people, I pray that your Holy Spirit could carry your word and your message into their heart. God, if there's somebody here this morning who doesn't have the peace in their heart of knowing that their sins are forgiven, that they have eternal life through Jesus Christ, then Lord, I pray that they would be convicted of their sin. I pray that they would be compelled to agree with you about their sin and put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation today. Lord, help them to realize they are personally responsible for believing in what you've already done for for them. And Lord, I pray that somebody might be saved today. Lord, for those that are saved, I pray that you would compel us that your love and the recognition of your love would constrain us and compel us to take that message into a lost and dying world. Lord, even as the bells of this church ring out, I pray that the message of the gospel would go forward from these pews into this community and surrounding area. Please, God, help us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?